You know, Lent is uh, the 40 days, not counting Sundays, before Easter. And so today, we're not in Lent because it's a Sunday. So we can be joyful and happy and exuberant. And so the first hymn we're going to sing today is, Ask Ye What Great Thing I Know, Jesus Christ. And so if you're able and willing, would you stand? Let's sing it. And we should uh, actually sing it, I think, like it's written. Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As you're able, would you stand and let's repeat the Apostles' Creed together this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> together this morning to pray. Let's start off with a few moments of silence and then we'll pray. Gracious and loving God, We come to this place to be awakened in the spirit. We come to this place to be joyful about your resurrection. And we also come to this place to be transformed from whatever it is we've done to whatever it is you would have us do. Of course, we come with petitions and requests for healing, for comfort, for peace, for those that are hurting. But as we get closer to you, we realize that hurting doesn't just mean physical. It means spiritual healing. So we pray for our own spiritual awakening 
trusting that as we are awakened in the spirit of Almighty God, that we will also be willing to be the body of Christ in a community that doesn't know him very well. We trust that as you go send us into the world, you will give us words to say, actions to live out, attitudes of gratitude in the midst of a hurting and troubled world. We do give thanks for our community where we live in relative safety compared to other places. We give thanks for our state, which seems to always have a little bit better economy and a better life than other states. And we give thanks for our country. And today, especially, we give thanks for clear skies with no missiles, bombs, or smoke. We understand that we stand up for freedom, but God, you have told us about freedom since the beginning. So today we pray for that freedom. The freedom, freedom to be freed from sin, from anger, from hostility, to a place of peace. We trust the scriptures. We trust the words of Jesus when he says there will be a time when we beat plowshares, excuse me, when we do weapons and show swords into plowshares and farm implements. We pray for that kind of peace, God, where the people of the world become unified in the spirit of the one true God. During Lent, we think about the sacrifices, the suffering, not just ours, but those that our Lord and Savior Jesus experienced. We remember that he rode or got down over Jerusalem and looked out and cried because not because of what was happening in Jerusalem that day, but what the world would do after he went to heaven. So we know about those times. But as we concentrate on the words of our Christ, we also know that he preached and taught love and mercy and grace. And if we're to live that out, then we need to become agents of love and mercy and grace. We, just like the disciples, struggle with what to say and what to do and what to believe. Sometimes even what to pray. When asked, Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now this next hymn that A.J. is going to lead us in was St. Patrick's hymn. He wrote the words. You'll hear them as we sing them. Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, King of my heart. Let's join together as we sing that as A.J. leads us.
Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke. As you're able, would you please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided the property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father called to his slaves quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back and who has devoured your property and pro with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. So I titled this message today, The Great Discovery, Who Am I Really? And there's a lot, there's a lot in this passage of scripture we could talk about. It wouldn't do any of it justice to do it all in uh, one of my three hour sermons. <laughs> However, there is one part of it that I think during Lent we can look at with clarity. In order for this younger son to come to an awareness of what he needed in life, he had to leave. He had to squander all his money. He had to be found with the pigs. Now, that doesn't sound that horrible to you and I, but if you're a Jew, it would be horrible to be feeding the pigs, the one thing you're prohibited from being around or eating or talking to. And yet, he was willing to eat food for the pigs. Now, I believe that all of us have the ability to be transformed. But I also believe that something has to happen in our lives for us to make that turnaround. It's not natural to wake up and tell everybody in the world that you're a sinner. 
Even the words that this scripture uses, wouldn't it be hard for us to say them? I've sinned before heaven and earth. I'm not worthy to be even a slave. But that's who we are. We have sinned. We are failures, if you will. Now maybe we've never had to sleep with the pigs. Maybe we haven't had that experience, and maybe that's why it's so hard for us, especially in this fairly affluent country, to ever think that we're so horrible that God wouldn't have anything to do with us unless we repent. But let me tell you, that's what Lent is about. We're supposed to repent. We're supposed to forget who we were. We're supposed to realize that we don't have to live that life anymore. And I think the message that the church has missed for so many years is that there's not a limit on who that is. It doesn't matter how bad your life got. It doesn't matter what you did before. In fact, I might even suggest that had you not done what you did before, you wouldn't be here today. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they have 10, 12 steps for recovery. In years past, I used to preach the 12 steps, the 12 weeks before Easter uh, on Saturday night, because we have a number of recovering folk there. The 10th step in Alcoholics Anonymous says, continue to take a personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Now, there's a lot in this story to talk about, but if we just focus right now on what the young son went through, this young son realized he was wrong. He realized his mistakes. He made amends for that by going home and telling his dad, I'm not worthy to even be your slave. And guess what? Dad loved him. Now, I don't know. I got two kids. There's times I've had to practice this. I have two stepkids. There's times I have to practice with them. There's forgiveness that we need to do. And we can't really move to that next level of our spiritual being until we do it. Even the Lord's Prayer, which we all just got through praying together, says the same thing. Forgive my trespasses as I'm willing to, trespass, to forgive others' trespasses. If there's not anything else we can accomplish during Lent this year, it's to realize that we need to be forgiving people. We need to get, go of that angst and hostility. And as someone told me earlier this morning, we need to work a whole lot on not complaining. All of us do. When I first got into recovery some 30 years ago, I was working for a psychiatric hospital and we were always looking for speakers to come. And there was a guy whose name was Thomas Henderson. He used to play for the Dallas Cowboys and the Oilers and others. And uh, I called him and we talked. We got to be pretty close. I talked to him probably once a week for a while. Thomas's experience of recovery was typical, but he was also wealthy and a great athlete, so his might have been different than ours, but during a Dallas Cowboys Denver Broncos game, Denver was beating the snot out of the Cowboys. <laughs> Thomas Henderson was on the sidelines higher than a kite during the game. Went to the TV. I'll never forget this because I thought he's going to get fired, and he did. Got right in front of the TV camera and said, we're number one. There wasn't anything about what they were doing that way that, that day that looked number one. Nothing. Tom Landry fired him. He said, should have fired him a long time ago is what Thomas said. Went over to the Oilers. Mom Phillips took him in. He'd be laying out in the field with his head on his helmet. Had a little Vicks sniffer down here in his uniform full of cocaine. He'd sniff it on the field. He was confronted with his addiction and he went to treatment for a hundred and some odd days. Got out of treatment, had one of the other athletes pick him up. They were driving along in Arizona through a 
desert area. He reached in the glove box, got out some marijuana, rolled it up, and smoked it, and told his buddies, I think this treatment's going to work. <laughs> Later on, he was arrested, went to prison. People asked him, said, well, Thomas, did you do what they said? He said, well, I may not have done exactly what they said, but I've done plenty. I deserve to be here. You see the correlation between him and the prodigal son. He made a life-changing decision, but it took prison to do it. And in that life-changing decision, he got out of that and started a halfway house in Austin and other things that he's done, and his recovery has been sound now for 30 years or more. Charles Colson was in the Watergate scandal, was a lawyer, went to prison. While he was there, he realized the need. You know, in the prison system, they don't provide Bibles or big books and AA and other things. That has to be done for volunteers outside. He created prison ministry. Now, I hope that none of us have to go to prison to change our lives, but I'm going to tell you, something in our life has to happen. We've seen this over the years. In my 20 years of doing ministry, I, I see people wander away from the church. It's an easy habit to get out of, isn't it? And then something happens. The doctor tells them something. And they show up. And they might have a smile on their face, and they might say they're happy to be here, but I want to tell you, friends, uh, there's not one in this room that doesn't have something they're hurting about right this minute. Amen. <clears throat> something. My experience in life is that if you know there's a God to turn to, you can experience life like this younger son where you know if I go home and confess to my dad, he will accept me again. He didn't know he was going to give him a fatted calf. He didn't know he was going to celebrate. He didn't know he was going to give him a signet ring. What he knew was that his dad's slaves were better treated than he had deserved. What we know, or what I know from working in rehabs for as long as I did is that this is particularly true of alcoholics and drug addicts, but it's true of all of us in a lot of ways. The doctor might say to you, if you don't change your ways, your eating habits, the things you're doing, you're going to have health risks. Our employer might tell us, you don't know, change your ways, show up at work on time, have a better living style. You're not going to be able to work here anymore. Your significant other, your spouse might say, if you don't straighten up your act, I'm going to put all your stuff on the front porch. <clears throat> and you know what we know is that any one of those by itself really doesn't work. A lot of people show up for treatment like Thomas did, go through it, and they're living in denial. They don't think it's really about them. It's about somebody else. A lot of people are told by the doctor, hey, I'm guilty too. I mean, you know, he says, how's your exercise program? I say, I'm doing great. <laughs> I exercise. I get up and walk to the car, walk from the car to where I'm going. <laughs> A lot of us have had issues at home and previous marriages or whatever where we'd like to claim it's all somebody else's fault, but let's realize that it takes two people to make a problem. Amen. Amen. And it's funny because when you get two of the three things, the odds go up significantly. When you get three of the three things, you have a little better than a 30% chance. Now, you know, thankfully, we have Jesus Christ, and he's not keeping school. But it seemed to me that during Lent, this message about this younger son is the message we need to hear. 
in the letter to James, there's a scripture that says, I look in a mirror and I see who I am and I walk away and I forget. So what I'm calling this message today is the great discovery. Who am I really? If you think Jesus doesn't already know, we need to meet later. He knows. Amen. But if you don't know who you are really, if you're not able to be in the same place with that younger son and say, I have made a mistake, I've ruined my life, I have nowhere to go except to go to my dad, to go to God, to turn my life around, to expect little, but maybe gain much. <coughs> I think it's a perfect Lent message. Actually, I think the tenth step is a perfect one. Continue to take a personal inventory. Know who you are. And when you're not who God wanted you to be, admit it. Now, the good news is you don't have to come confess to me. We don't do that. You can, but I won't remember anyway, but you can. My biggest concern is that you confess to yourself who you really are. Because if you'll lie to yourself, you'll lie to anybody. You need to know who you are and where you are in your place in God's kingdom. And friends, let me tell you where that is. For most of us, we don't deserve it. But God has offered it to us freely. My Lenten practice has been to, other than in the men's Bible study where we're reading in the Old Testament, has been to focus on those four books we call the Gospels. To focus a lot more on what Jesus said than on the historical stuff that happens before Jesus comes. Oh, I know, you can look at that, and it was prophetic and all that other stuff, but once he's here, what does he say? How does he live? What does he do? As the scripture in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians said, he hangs in the, out and eats with sinners. Thank God. He hangs out with you and me. <laughs> And his goal is to lead us toward salvation, which doesn't just happen when we die. It gets to happen right now. Our lives can change today. They can be transformed. We can be made into something new. We have a new life in Christ. And I can just tell you this from personal experience. If we'll dig a little bit more into who we really are, and we'll understand the gift that Jesus gave us when he willingly went to the cross. That he became sin so we could be forgiven for sin. There is no greater gift. That is the great discovery. Now, I don't know if any of us will create something wonderful like prison ministry. In fact, what I do know is that most of us may never see the fruit of our labor. But if we'll take those, instead of worrying so much about Easter eggs and, and baskets and beautiful flowers, we would instruct and teach and hopefully train our children to know that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. <laughs> My doctor is Jewish. And we were visiting with him the other day with the test results. I don't even know how it came up, but he said that Easter was his kid's favorite holiday. You get the paradox there. <laughs> he said, I send my kids to a Jewish school. We're Jewish people. We worship in a Jewish temple, and their favorite holiday is Easter. <laughs> because they get candy. That's what the world thinks about Easter. That's really what the world thinks about Christmas, too. Let's just exchange gifts and go shopping all the way from Halloween to Christmas, right? <clears throat> this message is so much more important. It is that song we sang, this is that great thing I know. Jesus Christ is the glory. And we live in His glory. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
So during this Lenten time, as we struggle our way through knowing what to do and what not to do and what to give up and what not to give up, it's not about that. It's about doing something during Lent that brings you closer to God. That brings your spirit more in line with God's spirit. We all struggle. <laughs> when my friend Bill Nash had COVID, I think he called me every day. He didn't feel worthy. He did not feel worthy. And almost every day I said, Bill, Bill, you're, you're feeding the hungry, you're clothing the naked, you're taking care of children, you're giving them a life, you're giving them a chance to become champions. If anybody I know is doing it, you won't. Amen. Doesn't make him bad because he had doubts. It makes him in the same place as this younger son when he realizes that even though he's done so much, maybe there's more he can do. Maybe he hasn't done everything he can. Maybe he isn't living the life God wants him to live. So the question for us today is, what about us? Can you see yourself in the youngest son? You know, we could talk a long time about the elder son, right? Who He'd been there all the time, did all the stuff he was supposed to do. But if you're a parent, you know that time when that son or daughter that you've been estranged from, that's been separated from you, when they've been gone out of your life, when they come back, there is cause for celebration. And so today I wanted to concentrate just on that one part. It's a big, long scripture. It has a lot of stuff. You can go home and read it and study it and think about it. But I wanted us to come at this today from a position of a young son that got what he thought he wanted and found out what he really needed. And I think, for me anyway, it's a lesson I need to contemplate and think about. How about you? Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we close our service today, you know, we don't pass an offering plate right now. we we'll probably get back to that pretty soon. But we're going to sing together. If today be the day you would unite with our church, come forward as we sing. We'll be singing Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And the offering is in a basket in the back. As you're able, would you stand?
Johnny, put that last screen back on there, if yes. you will. <laughs> yeah, let's sing the chorus. No, no piano. Let's just sing. Get us started, Ann, and then you can. Just a closer walk with me. Let's do this benediction together. Give us God, a little sun, a little happiness, and some water. Give us a heart to comfort those in pain. Give us the ability to be strong, wise, and free, so that we may be as generous with others as we are with ourselves. Finally, God, let us all live as your own one family. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.